July 24th, 1984. That's one of those dates that's permanently etched in my memory. It's the date of the most memorable experience in my life. An experience that gave me four things. A really good scare, a great story to tell, a healthy new perspective on life, and by far the most important, a new nickname. <laughs> it was a mid-afternoon of a day off, about halfway through my first summer working in Alaska at Denali National Park. I was on a hillside next to the Thurifer River, struggling through a thick, branch, thick patch of willows, working my way to a spot where the river curved away from the gravel bar that from this, this point stretched miles on the other side of the river because I wanted to be able to walk a lot quicker because I was three miles from the nearest shelter, the Isles and Visitor Center. I didn't have any rain gear along and there were dark storm clouds looming all around. <clears throat> now I'm the first to admit that in my worry and my haste, I wasn't quite as in tune with my surroundings as usual. But that's still a pretty lousy excuse for the fact that with miles of clear visibility behind him, I didn't see the grizzly bear until he was on the opposite bank of the river, no more than 40 feet from me, looking at me with a distinctly hungry look in his eye. <laughs> now I had, of course, prepared myself for grizzly encounters by reading the park literature and attending ranger talks, <laughs> and I was convinced that if it ever happened that I would respond with dignity and grace. But all I could do was stand there my jaw wide open, <laughs> muttering over and over, oh my god. When my mind's emergency computational system finally kicked in, I remembered the park ranger's suggestion of waving your arms over your head and shouting, and however possible, identifying yourself to the bear as an animal he doesn't prey upon. So I waved my arms and shouted, my name's Robert Grover. I work at the gas station by the park and I mean you no harm. His response was a move a little closer to the river. And a survey of present conditions, depth, rate of current, that sort of thing. I could tell he'd never been to a ranger talk. The next thing that I remember was if the bear remained interested in establishing a relationship it may be best to lie on the ground and play dead. This conjured up an image that was not at all appealing, and my first attempt to follow the ranger's suggestions had not met with the desired results, so I decided maybe it's time to improvise. So I started heading up the hillside in an effort to increase the distance between the two of us to where I felt more comfortable. As I climbed, I kept glancing back, and I watched the bear as he strolled upstream to a seemingly calculated point, plunged into the river, and swam across the very fast-moving current, showing the awesome strength of his limbs. I compared my scrawny limbs to his and realized that it was in my best interest to avoid any, any, any uh, struggle of power. So I just kept walking quickly. When I got up to the top of the hill, I continued on this flat bluff as fast as I could. While I was hoping that maybe by nosing around where I'd been when he first saw me, the bear had finally become convinced that I was just a nasty tasting human being, full of, full of cholesterol and preservatives, <laughs> definitely not worth bothering with for a meal. When I was about 80 yards past the top of the hill, the bear finally appeared at about the same place where I had crested the hill. He apparently hadn't taken the hint that I wasn't interested in establishing a relationship. So out of frustration, I started waving my arms and shouting again. I would inconveniently forgotten one of the things that I'd learned about grizzly bears. They really can't see clearly for more than about 50 yards. So he was probably unaware of my location. That is, until he heard my shouts. <laughs> <laughs> then he looked up and snorted, as if to say, oh, there you are, and started running slowly through the tundra towards me. 
Here I was, a month and a half before my 30th birthday, my whole life in front of me, <laughs> regretting all the things that I neglected to say and do for my family and friends, wondering what I could have made of my life that had been longer. Just before the process of seeing my life pass before my eyes convinced, he stopped about 20 yards short of me and started digging. Apparently some ground squirrel or some other small creature had distracted him. I didn't wait to find out what. I just took advantage of the momentary distraction and slowly, quietly, headed to the edge of the bluff, which happened to overlook a small canyon which led back down to the gravel walk. Once I was down the hillside, far enough so that I was out of his sight, I started running. I immediately found myself in the stiff patch of willows and I was beating the branches aside with my arms. One branch knocked off my cap and clip on sunglasses, but I was making so much noise and I couldn't tell the bear was following. <laughs> Even under these conditions of extreme duress, I was able to think clearly enough to realize that a cap and sunglasses are easier to replace than body parts. So I kept running. I finally made it down to the gravel bar and stopped to look and listen for a few seconds. There was no sign of the bear. I let out a big sigh of relief, quietly thanked whatever small creature had saved, just saved my life, quite possibly by sacrificing his own, and walked very quickly to the visitor center. While I walked, I had a whole new perspective on life. I realized just how fleeting it is. I, with my theme here, time to live in the now, a perspective that I've kept ever since then. So my grizzly encounter gave me four things. A really good scare, a great story to tell, a healthy new perspective, and one more thing. One of the first people that I told the story of my grizzly encounter to was a coworker, Jim Stamatis, at the, at the gas station. The next day, we were both at work. He looked me in the eye. 